So, uh, let's start with talking about what this session is about. Uh, well, is it about data verification or is it about audit? Well, the way I like to look at this is uh, we've got the, uh, the ref submission data that will be coming in um, up to uh, end of November next year and we uh, want some assurance over that data which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that um, shortly and the overall question of uh, how confident are we in, uh, in this data, how confident are we that, we that it's right, how confident are we that the data are robust, that's really a, a question of, of verification. And then within that, uh, a part, albeit quite a significant part of, uh, of verification, is audit. So, so that's where we actually have um, a dialogue with, uh, with, with yourselves, um, uh, with the submitting HIs, uh, looking at particular elements of your uh, submission and giving you a chance to say, well, this is, this is what we think is good about it, this is why we think it's, it's robust, this is why we think it's right. So, uh, if, we, if you look at the, the principles underpinning audit data verification, so uh, from our point of view, from the point of view of the REF team and also from the point of view of the funding bodies, uh, audit and data verification of REF submissions is necessary to support principles of fairness and to, to adhere to good regulation. Uh, in other words, uh, are the data uh, being submitted uh, accurate and in line with uh, the policy uh, described within the guidance on submissions? Uh, and also uh, to, to provide for us sufficient confidence in the quality and reliability of data and uh, the assessment outcomes. So also, are, are the data sufficient and robust so that when we feed that into the REF peer review exercise then uh, that we know that we're, um, we're providing sufficient and accurate data to the panels so that they can do their job and at the end of it we come out with uh, accurate uh, sub-profiles um, for your submissions. So, uh, what can be audited or what, rather, what, what do we seek verification on? Uh, well, any part of a REF submission can be audited. Uh, that's an important principle because we can't uh, really be in a position of saying, well, we've got this entire policy, we've got the guidance on submissions, here's what we want you to do, this is how you want us to do it, but this kind of, kind of little corner here, we're just going to say we're just not interested in it. That's not how it works. We, we require the ability, potentially, to audit uh, any part of a REF submission, and therefore uh, our expectation is that institutions should maintain accurate records in order to verify any information provided as part of their submission. And uh, I'm sure most, if not all of you, already know this, but the guidance on audit and data verification was published on the 11th of June. I expect you've probably all uh, had a chance to have a look at that. <coughs> so, what will we actually do? Uh, okay, so the, the procedures we've got are going to involve the following processes. Some of it is going to be routine checks. Uh, that will be just things that we generally do within the REF team. Uh, don't necessarily need to come to you for further information as long as we, uh, we already have the information that we, uh, that we need. So one example of that is we've just conducted an eligibility check for everybody who is expecting to, uh, to submit to REF 2021 and most of that was undertaken by the REF team, just uh, undertaken routine checks. Uh, some of it, a lot of it, uh, is structured and targeted audits where we will sample data that's in your submission and we'll ask you to tell us why you think that those data are accurate. We'll also undertake systematic data comparisons. So you'll have seen from the audit guidance that there are a number of uh, points where we're going to undertake systematic uh, comparisons with your piece of data. Uh, some of that will be for, um, for staff uh, submissions and some of that will be for, uh, for research environment questions. And there's also uh, the option of panel instigated audits. In other words, the, uh, right through the exercise, the assessment panels, uh, 
who are obviously uh, fundamental and key to the overall exercise, uh, have uh, the opportunity, if they choose to, to raise all the queries about particular um, uh, research outputs or indeed other aspects of the submission uh, that they're assessing. And they can do that. So what will we all do? Well, a, a lot of it is not what you came here to, to talk about today, but I'm just going to run down it quickly for completeness. So we'll uh, audit staff, so we'll check staff eligibility and make sure the staff have been appropriately included. Um, we will look at research outputs and part of the uh, verification and therefore audit uh, of research outputs obviously includes open access. We're also going to be looking at impacts. Uh, we will be uh, conducting verification of environment data. Uh, uh, there will also be some uh, verification of uh, information provided in the environment templates and the institutional level statements. And we also conduct some verification on staff circumstances. But I'll, um, I'll concentrate for the rest of the session on open access because that's what we're here to look at today. And uh, open access, that was a big change for REF 2021 in terms of actually having uh, an open access policy embedded within the guidance on submissions with some specific requirements for uh, REF outputs. Um, within that, because this was new and because we recognised um, the issues uh, of managing this across the sector, we've included 5% tolerance of in-scope outputs that are not compliant and don't have an exception. So your outputs broadly can fall into uh, non, uh, not in scope. So anything accepted before April 2016 isn't, isn't in scope. Um, it, they could be compliant, they could have an exception on them or up to 5% of those can um, uh, be non-compliant uh, without, uh, without affecting the assessment process. If more than 5% of uh, your in-scope outputs aren't compliant, then obviously that will affect the assessment process because some of those outputs will, uh, will need to be marked as, um, uh, as not for assessment. Uh, the process, and this is, a, this is a really key thing that I wanted to talk about today because um, uh, I want to make sure this is really kind of understood in terms of how the process works is a three-stage process uh, for undertake, undertaking and operating the verification of open access. And uh, I produced this handy diagram uh, to try and talk you through. So, three-stage process. Stage one, this is uh, what we described in the audit guidance as a risk assessment. And uh, it isn't part of the audit, it's part of the verification process, but it's not part of the audit. Uh, it's really important to recognise that, because what that means, the, the implication of that is, that anything that happens in stage one can't affect your submission data. Okay? And what it's, the purpose of stage one is to help us try and understand, well, what parts, um, what, what institutions do we possibly um, want to take more of a look at in terms of uh, how their open access process is working and what institutions uh, do we think broadly we're, um, we, we don't feel the need to, 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 to intervene or, or, or investigate any further. Uh, it uses uh, elements of your submission data and it uses elements of third party data. So the submission data that we're looking at is, um, is only actually um, its exceptions and purely its um, where you've used the other exception. And the reason for that, and again, this is really important, it's not because if you use a lot of other exceptions that you are in some way non-compliant or less compliant than other institutions. It's simply that the other exception is by definition less well defined. So if you're putting in a high level of our exceptions, we don't know what that means in practice. So if you've got a high level of other exceptions, 
we're likely to want to take it to stage two in the process review so that we can answer those questions about why you've got a high level of other exceptions. And what we're expecting is that uh, normally that process review uh, will answer those. We'll get onto that uh, shortly. Also, third party data. Uh, yes, we are using Unpaywall. Yes, we are using Core. We are. You're not. I'll, I'll come on to that a little bit more um, shortly. But the point is, what we wanted to do is, is, is use something to try and give us some nudges towards those institutions that we might be more interested in uh, and away from those institutions where we might be less interested in. Now, we do recognise that uh, we're only looking at certain characteristics of the core and unpayable data, not an entire set of characteristics that describe the overall policy. Uh, that's necessary because they don't contain all the characteristics that describe the policy. Uh, and, uh, and secondly, we know that there, uh, there isn't complete coverage in that data, and we know that there isn't complete accuracy in that data. We're aware of that. Um, the point of the exercise was never to try and use that third party data to give us an, an extremely accurate view of how compliant you are. That was never the purpose. It's merely to give us some data that tells us something about whether we might have a bit more or a bit less of an interest in, uh, in your process. And it's, and it's not the only thing, as I said before, the other, the, the other thing crucially is the, uh, the use of other exceptions. Just to reiterate the point, I'm, I'm, I appreciate I'm hammering this home a little bit, but I, I, I want to make sure this is very, very clearly um, uh, set out today, is that if we decide on the basis of stage one that we are going to select you for, uh, for stage two, for the process review, that is not an audit opinion. In other words, at that point, we have no uh, knowledge of or basis to assume that you are any less compliant than anybody else. It simply means that you've been selected for the next stage, stage of the process. And by, by you, I don't mean you, I mean your institution has been selected. That's all it means, okay? So getting selected for stage two is not, absolutely not, an audit judgment or an audit opinion, opinion on you, okay? That's very important. Okay, so if we go to stage two, what do we do? Okay, so it's a process review. Again, we described this in the guidance, uh, in the audit guidance. And what we're going to be doing is looking at your institution's procedures for managing open access. So, uh, if you have a, a higher number of uh, uh, other exceptions, we would expect that your process would say, okay, this is why we're using the other exception. This is how we've arrived at the use of it. These are the kind of particular reasons underpinning it. And if that's set out in a way that's, that's, that's clear uh, and appropriate, and um, sensibly describes the way that you're operating your process, um, then that will answer those questions. Similarly, um, it will be uh, looking at things like you know, how, how discoverable um, uh, your outputs are and answering questions like um, uh, how soon you're depositing outputs um, and, uh, and meeting the access requirements. If we have concerns about that process, and, uh, and, and, and we'll be measuring that on a, on a set of criteria so that we'll be, we'll be measuring everybody on a kind of equal basis in terms of how the process works. If we have concerns um, that we don't quite understand that the process is really supporting the accuracy of the submission data that you provided us, then we could go to substantive testing. Now, Substantive testing, basically there, we will look at the detail for selected outputs, we'll be identifying evidence to support the status that you've returned in your, uh, in your submission. Now, again, bear in mind, this is, this is actually just one field in the submission. The only thing that we're actually verifying is the open access status that you've declared. So if you said that it's uh, out of scope, okay, is it genuinely out of scope? 
Uh, if you said it's compliant, okay, is it compliant? If you said it's got an exception, okay, uh, what exception have you said and uh, is it an appropriate exception? Uh, and can you demonstrate why you've come up with that exception? Uh, we did say in the audit guidance, some of that will be by random sampling. Some of it can be using data in court and unpayable. But, and again, I stress this, if the data in, in, in court or in payable is wrong and causes us to select, uh, select outputs for substantive sampling, we will only look at the data you supply back to us to determine the accuracy of what's in your submission. So you have, at that point, an absolute opportunity to override whatever core and unpayable say. In other words, you, will, you can't have your submission data changed on the basis of what is in core and unpayable. We may look at it on the basis of what's in there, but you'll never change it on the basis of what's in, uh, in the metadata um, services. And just to reiterate what's in the, in the blue square there, data changes, in other words, changes to your submission data can and will only happen in stage three, so will only happen as a result of substantive testing. Okay, I've talked through a lot of this already. <laughs> so um, I've, I'll just use this as a bit of a summary then. Um, the risk-based approach ranks you on other exceptions, whether an OA copy is accessible, whether the available copy is searchable text, those are the two data points from within um, from, from within unpayable, and also whether it's deposited within 92 days of publication, that's from core. Uh, I, I will say, because this has come up a couple of times, um, firstly, the reason we chose 92 days is because the policy is three months, and the longest three month period in the calendar is 92 days. I appreciate that um, there are other lengths being used in uh, institution practice and also um, in CRIS systems, but that was the reason we spoke, we chose this, we chose 92 days there. Um, we are, as I say, we're using submission um, uh, data, the other exception, the third party services. Okay, REOX. Um, let's talk about REOX. Um, Right, REOX uh, is not mandatory for REF. I've had a few questions about this already. Um, uh, there was some discussion about REOX uh, this morning, and the REOX is there. It's available as a tool for you to use, or a method for you to use, but uh, it's not mandatory for REF. Uh, I have no expectation uh, for you to use it. Uh, whether you do or don't use Reox application profile won't affect your audit in any way. Uh, we won't be using it as a tool uh, in REF either. Slightly different for unpayable and core. Still not mandatory for REF. In other words, you don't have to use unpayable and core. If you want to, fine, do, I don't mind. Um, if you don't want to, fine, I don't mind. Uh, you probably, just to kind of reiterate what they are, you probably know their metadata says that basically provides some uh, information about uh, the open access status of uh, outputs uh, and um, other, um, other information about the outputs. Uh, we'll mostly be doing it by um, indexing on DOI and matching that up to the DOI in your, uh, in your ref returns. The point is, with these, we will be using them as a tool but we will form no audit opinion either way on whether you do or you don't use them as a tool. Uh, if you uh, haven't integrated your, um, your, repo uh, your repositories with uh, Unpayable and Core, that's fine. There's no ref requirement for you to do so. Uh, if you have, that's fine too. If it means that um, because you haven't, then there's a uh, lower coverage of data in those services, then uh, we recognise that's in case for a number of institutions and we'll take account of that in the, um, in the ranking algorithm. So uh, it's purely a tool for us for selection. Okay, in the process review, just talk about a couple other points here. Um, 
Well, Lance KTI is deemed by stage one as higher risk, and by higher risk, I only mean, are we more interested in looking at your process? I don't mean, do we at this point think you are non-compliant? That's not what I mean by high risk, okay? But if you're deemed by stage one, or stage one as high risk, we'll ask you to send us your process with evidence that you're managing the, pro the, 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 the policy uh, within your process. Um, we will want you um, to address gold open access uh, within the process. Just a reminder here about gold. Uh, gold uh, is a route of compliance, it's not an exception. I know most of you know that, but it, 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 it was previously being talked about possibly as an exception. It isn't, it's a route of compliance. So if you've got outputs that you deem to be gold within your process, you should be returning them as compliant in your REF data. We don't look at the actual data at the process review stage. As I said earlier, where there's insufficient evidence to demonstrate a robust and well-managed process for open access based on a set of criteria that we apply equally to all, the, all HEIs, we move to stage three. So that's substantive testing. So this is a targeted sample audit of outputs that are marked as compliant with an exception. And uh, where the audit evidence indicates that an OA status is different from the one in the submission data, the status will be updated to reflect the audit evidence. Um, that can affect the 5% tolerance if we need to change some outputs uh, to be non-compliant. Um, so that's just something to consider. And as I said earlier, sampling may be based on data in on pay one and core, but the evidence to show the OA status is correct will be based solely on your own record keeping, not on pay one and core. Okay, so what evidence would we be looking for? Right, bear in mind again, what's in your submission data is the open access status. What isn't in your submission data are things like uh, accepted date, deposit date, end of embar embargo date. Um, though, a date that the, um, the, the output was, was uh, was made available following the end of embargo. Those kind of things, that, 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 those are all kind of uh, policy requirements, but they're not actually data that are captured within your submission, okay? So what we're verifying is the open access status. So, underneath that, there are three policy requirements, deposit, discovery, and access. So we will look at audit evidence for each of the policy requirements underpin the open access status. But the question we're very much looking at is, have you, has your record keeping got information to say, yes, this particular output has met the deposit requirements, yes, this particular output has met the discovery requirements, yes, this particular output has met the access requirements, okay? But it's the open access status that's the one that we're verifying, okay? Uh, we've got some more information um, for you to look at. I'm sure you're all aware of www.ref.ac.uk. There's plenty on there, including guidance on submissions and the audit guidance. And also, I can tell you that we will shortly, within the next fortnight, have a new open access summary document where we're collating together all of the information that's in uh, the guidance on submissions, panel criteria and working methods, and the audit guidance, plus the diagram that I uh, showed you on uh, the earlier slide. Those uh, are all going to appear in the new open access summary. So you've got a kind of single comprehensive open access document to refer to with everything in one place. So that is, uh, so it's now 10 past two, so almost exactly to time. So the next thing is, if you want to break out into some huddle.